Assalamualaikum. Wah rahmatullah, wah barakatuh, om swastiatu dan salam. Salam sejahtera and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone um, that's gathering here today to um, celebrate the World Mental Health Day seminar for the Indonesian Institute. We would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We would like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are viewing this presentation. In addition, we would like to state that our work here today should in some way, no matter how small, contribute to the journey of reconciliation of cultures that is necessary for sustaining a healthy and diverse world. Now, a little bit about the seminar or the webinar that you're all attending. As you can see, there are some esteemed panelists that are joining me here today. And we're going to talk a little bit about mental health in Indonesia. The seminar is going to be broken into two sections. The first section is a series of recorded presentations from all of our panelists and a short film. During that session, we really encourage you to open up the chat box, open up the Q&A and to participate wholly either in Indonesian or in English. Our panelists are pretty comfortable with either. And we invite you to start a discussion about what's happening in terms of some of the issues around mental health. We know that basically we, there, is a, there is a number of people that are joining us today with high levels of expertise on mental health. At the same time, we know that there are some people who are new to the area and so we're providing this seminar as a bit of an introduction to some of the issues around mental health in Indonesia. We are going to talk to you about some of the basic issues that are facing mental health systems development in Indonesia. Mental health has historically dwelt in the shadows of the global health and development agenda and only recently has moved from the margins to become a central priority in research and policy. Mental disorders account for about 30% of worldwide non-fatal disease burden and 10% of the overall disease burden, including death and disability. And the cost to the global economy is estimated to reach as high as USD set $6 trillion by the year 2030. So, you know, it's kind of important. Large and middle and low income countries like Indonesia are struggling with a plethora of challenges in delivering adequate mental health care to, well, 270 million citizens. There is so little funding. And then there's the sheer numbers. Estimations based on the 2016 risk estas, so that's the basic health survey, indicate that um, 450,000 families in Indonesia have at least one member diagnosed with schizophrenia. We know that number is an underestimate. We also know that a number of these individuals are being subject to human rights abuses, that they are being left to languish in situations of forcible restraint or confinement, called in Indonesia, basung. And we know from estimations based on the risk estas quoted by Human Rights Watch that as many as 57,000 Indonesians have ever experienced this situation of bustle, including one of our um, panelists who's speaking to you today. We also know that approximately the population of Australia, so 26 million people, are suffering from clinically relevant, so that means symptoms that probably require treatment of anxiety and depression. Think about that, that's a lot of people, 26 million people to, if we're sitting in Australia, directly um, our northern neighbours. Although there's a shift to community-based outcare models of care, Indonesia has 48 mental hospitals and 269 psychiatric wards in general hospitals. These are still the primary sources of care. There are just over a thousand registered psychiatrists now these numbers you must, you must take with a grain of salt because they're changing consistently and we don't have great numbers for Indonesia. There are about 2000 clinical psychologists. They're not all engaged in clinical practice treating patients. 7,000 community mental health nurses, 1500 mental health trained GPs and 7,000 lay mental health workers or kader. These are unevenly distributed across the archipelago. Most of them in Java, not in the outer re regions. And there are a number of areas that don't, that don't have doctors or psychiatrists, even within the mental hospitals themselves. Need outstrips supply. Less than half of all primary care centres and only 56% of government district hospitals are equipped to handle mental health cases. Now, fortunately, there are many passionate and committed mental health personnel, government officials, academics, consumer group founders, mental health advocates, and others who are working tirelessly to implement the vision embodied by the 2014 mental health law. We've got many of these individuals 
well, a, a small subsection of these individuals gathered with the, um, here within our panel today, who are going to talk a little bit about their little snippets of what mental health in Indonesia means. So now, our first, but, um, our first panelist is Dr. Dr. Nova, Nova Rianti Yusuf, a registered psychiatrist and current head of the Jakarta Psychiatric Association and Secretary General of the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Associations. Many titles, but Nova. She's a PhD in public health from UI after studying global health and social medicine at Harvard. She publishes extensively. Global Asia Magazine heralds her as the most influential female legislator for, for her parliamentarian work. For those who don't know, she was a Depe Air representative or a House of Representatives representative from 2009 to 2014 and also from 2018 to 19, where she introduced and helped pass the 2014 Indonesian Mental Health Law. This is what she's going to talk to us about today. Uh, hi, my name is Nofa Rianti Yusuf. Um, I'm from Indonesia. I'm a former member of parliament from the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia. Currently, I'm the Secretary General for the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Associations, um, psychiatrists, and I think I feel honor and I think it's a pleasure for me to share with everybody on World Mental Health Day with the Astro Australian National University. So thank you for having me. Um, I am going to elaborate on the progress of the National Mental Health Law in Indonesia. This is um, going to be a very brief presentation, so I hope I can uh, get it uh, in 10 minutes. Okay, yep, so this is the map of Indonesia, and apparently, um, I think most of you have visited <laughs> Indonesia. Um, Indonesia consists of over 17,000 islands and the fourth most populous country with about 270 million people and going. And um, what really ticked me off in um, why I decided to uh, become a member of parliament was to uh, initiate the mental health bill so I can pass it into law. Um, and one of the triggers was uh, when Indonesia was being highlighted in Time magazine in 2003, uh, that Indonesia had the lowest rating for the provision of mental health services in Asia. So um, for instance, in 2003, we only had one psychiatrist per 500,000 um, population. Um, so as a, as a background, uh, I was a rookie <laughs> trying to initiate the mental health bill. Um, the argumentation was that 18,000 people with mental disorders being shackled or physically restrained at their homes and shelters. And even worse, it was a, a data in 2007. So in 2013, as the discussion uh, or the writing of the law took place, the basic health research in 2013 came up with a more shocking number uh, that the proportion of household with household members suffering from psychosis and performing shackling or chaining is 14.3%, roughly estimated about 56,000 um, people with mental disorder or with psychosis. Um, then I found out that if I entered uh, the parliament, um, they had this regulation uh, in 2009 and 2014. It's about the procedure to um, propose a bill. So a bill may be proposed by the House of Representatives or the president or the regional representative council. And even better, a bill can be proposed by the member. So uh, that's um, the opportunity, I think, for me. Uh, that's why I ran. I was studying um, psychiatry at the University of Indonesia. And suddenly um, I had this change of heart that, okay, as soon as, gra as I graduated, I, I would uh, run for office uh, and try to initiate the mental health bill with the argumentation that I've been, I had been having on, on my head. So it was on uh, 2009, October 1st, I, I was sworn in as member of parliament. 
um, yeah, strangely, I was in the parliament between 2009, 2014, and also 2018 and 2019. So uh, after five years, the milestone, I guess, was the mental health bill was passed into law in 2014. And it was in effect since um, August 8, uh, 2014. And to celebrate that, uh, me along with... Um, people with mental disorders or with psychosocial disabilities, we fountain dip in the uh, parliamentary compound to celebrate that something that was still very marginalized uh, mental health issue, it could be passed uh, into law. So in 2014, um, if, uh, well, this is actually a very good coverage, uh, totally different from uh, how we were being portrayed in the Time magazine, because the, uh, the headlines say chains no more. So uh, Indonesia ha has a new law um, and vows to take better care of um, its 16 million people suffering from mental illness. And at the time, the mental health professionals um, was 1.07 per 100,000 population. Um, it was, mm, we only had 773 psychiatrists at the time, but now the number is growing. We are at the number of 1,000 uh, 1, psychiatrists uh, for the uh, at the time being. We had 451 clinical psychologists, 6,500 mental health nurses. Uh, however, in 2014, when the bill was just passed into law, the allocation for mental health budget was still 1% of the total health budget, which is still the same until now. <laughs> so what was being regulated in the mental health law? Uh, it was actually a very ambitious law because we try, well, we try to have a, a foundation of mental health system in Indonesia. So it may it be... Um, the uh, facilities, the service, or the provision of mental health professionals, um, particularly in the general provisions. We try to um, fight the stigma on how to address people with mental disorder. So we don't call them orangila or, or lunatics. So we try to introduce the terminologies uh, to the people. So now I am so happy that um, quite a large number of people now already know how to address people with mental disorder. And the, and the mental health effort here, um, one of the chapters in the law, uh, we were not just focusing on curative aspect of the mental health effort, but also promotion, um, prevention, and also rehabilitation. And most importantly, in the concluding provision, the implementing regulation of this law must be enacted by no later than one year <laughs> following the enactment of this law. And today it's already 2021 and it's the last 100 days, if I'm not mistaken. So, yep. Um, so what is the progress like um, uh, with the mental health law now? So after the mental health law was passed in 2014, now in 2021, we are still waiting for the implementing regulations and also other derivative regulations. In 2015, however, there was effort uh, by the Ministry of Health uh, to follow up one of the most important implementing regulations, uh, which is government regulation. And government regulation itself will in, um, involve at least four ministries with the Ministry of Health as the leading sector. And after uh, the government regulation is issued, it will be followed by other derivative regulations that will be issued by the stakeholder ministries, such as the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Social Affairs. Um, why we need the implementing and derivative regulations. There are several crucial reasons. One, we have um, a regional autonomy system. So somewhat the central government and the local governments need to bridge 
um, to equalize their perceptions and to coordinate mental health services um, in Indonesia. And the most affected is, of course, the mental health services at the grassroots level. For instance, the implementation of free shackling in Indonesia. Uh, we need accurate data. Uh, we need coordination with the health insurance claim, which Indonesia uh, is already in the universal health coverage system. And uh, with the healthcare facilities, case findings and so on um, and so forth. Um, so between 2015 uh, until 2021, despite uh, there were no implementing and derivative regulations uh, being um, issued by the uh, stakeholder ministries. But in the past few years, progress also took place in the form of programs, um, indicators of mental health, are included in the health ministry's regulations, uh, such as SPM or minimum service standard and indicator keluarga sehat or family health indicators. Um, progresses, however, seems to be um, taking place also if the minister of health is interested in the mainstreaming of the mental health policy in Indonesia. I believe that uh, the interest of the Minister of Health will speed up the policy process within the ministry itself for national interest. And I'm very happy actually that this year, despite the pandemic, the government regulation was in discussion between the Ministry of Health and the stakeholders along with the experts. And um, I also, uh, took place. Um, I also uh, joined uh, this team. And now the draft has reached uh, the Bureau of Law and Organization in the ministry in order to harmonize, harmonize the draft uh, before further steps. Um, and the Minister of Health was also surprisingly reaching out to the Indonesian Psychiatric Association to get input about mental health services, priorities, and how to be in line with international consensus, um, such as the suicide prevention target goal in the SDGs, which was not part of the blueprint in Indonesia before. So um, the inputs have been submitted by the Indonesian Psychiatric Association to the Ministry of Health. So we are um, hopeful that there will be some robust improvement in the mainstreaming of mental health sector in Indonesia, other than of course, uh, a follow-up itself to the mental health law, but also to the budget allocation in the overall, because I have uh, noticed that there has been a specific allocation for mental health during the pandemic, but we need this allocation also in um, the program that is not only related to the pandemic. Um, I was also involved in the discussion with the Ministry of Health in um, preparing prevention guidelines uh, during the pandemic. And I think uh, this is a very good step if uh, the Minister of Health wants to, um, to be in line with the SDGs target goals, particularly the suicide prevention. So I think this is one step forward from the um, minist um, Ministry of Health and of course the Minister uh, of Health. And um, so that's pretty much the progress of the mental health law right now. What I wanted to uh, share. Um, thank you very much again uh, to the Australian National University for having me on this World Mental Health Day. Thank you, Mbak Nova. That was that was fabulous. I'm, I really wanted to hear more in terms of some of the prevention guidelines, I think, around, um, around uh, suicide prevention, but also around generally how Indonesia is handling um, the mental health crisis during the COVID um, 19 
crisis. But I think we'll have to wait until question and answer time um, and also maybe some, some activity in the chat to be, a, be able to talk about that in a little bit more detail. I want to throw it across now to Professor Hans Pols. Um, Professor Hans Pols is a psychiatric historian um, at, from the School and History of Philosophy of Science at the University of Sydney and a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. He works on both Australian and Indonesian populations. And he's going to give us a bit of a potted history on psychiatry in Indonesia. Now, um, Hans has actually got a new book out at the moment, Traumatic Past in Asia. He has many books actually to, to his name, one of which I think he's going to plug a little bit at the end of his talk, I, I have I have forewarning. Um, uh, which is a, a collaboration for a lot of um, actors on Indonesian mental health reform and they're looking to, ahead towards the future of um, uh, psychiatry in Indonesia. So I'd like to welcome to the screen, Professor Hans Pols, um, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of psychiatry in Indonesia. I am Hans Pols from the University of Sydney, and I will give you a very, very brief history of psychiatry and mental health care in the Dutch East Indies and Indonesia. Renewal in asylum care worldwide started around 1800 with the introduction of moral treatment. Filipino and Samuel Tuk are the big names. Before that, the mentally ill were considered as violent brutes who had to be segregated. Moral treatment saw the mentally ill as confused children in need of fatherly guidance. The best approach to dealing with them is to place them in a beautifully built asylum where there's lots of opportunity for work in the gardens and work in the asylum itself, because that gets your mind of things and also would help with rehabilitation later on. One of the origin stories of moral treatment is Filipino freeing the insane uh, during the, the French Revolution. The story is a little bit embellished, nonetheless interesting and instructive. These renewals were brought to the Netherlands by Professor Schroeder van der Kolk, uh, who led the renewal of asylum care in the Netherlands. It was then brought to the Dutch East Indies through Bauer and Smith, who started with a survey of the state of the care of lunatics and the mentally ill. The conclusion was, of course, it's terrible, and they recommended a purpose-built asylum be built. This became the hospital near Batenzorg, or Bogor, which opened in 1881. State-of-the-art mental hospital, a great investment of colonial funds. It had a lot of agricultural colonies, workshop, there were no fences, and there was no restraint, just isolation. Uh, at that time, this mental hospital, today's Marzuki Mari, was outside Bogor in the countryside. This, of course, has changed over time. And these images of patients working in the garden and in the workshop are fairly common of mental hospital care at this time worldwide. In 1904, Lawang followed uh, pavilion style care, lots of work for patients, then Magalang Hospital, and also Sabang, which was destroyed during World War II. And the patients were brought somewhere in Malaysia, actually. We know what happened to them, although it's fairly easy to uh, hypothesize. So in colonial times, there were four major mental hospitals and about 12 secular clinics in major urban areas for acute care. If someone needed more care after three months, they would be transferred to mental hospitals. Now the problem, and this is the problem with mental hospital care all over the world at this time, overcrowding soon started, funding was never sufficient, in particular during the Great Depression, um, the hospitals filled up with people suffering from severe forms of mental illness like dementia, and you know, the system gets clogged up. Nonetheless, at this time, the Dutch East Indies featured the very best mental health care system all over Asia. It has the highest number of beds per capita. So it was truly impressive, and Dutch physicians advertised this model in Asia as exemplary, and as a matter of fact, physicians from other countries in Asia, keen to see how it worked to apply this vision in their own countries. 
Then, of course, Jap Japanese occupation and the war of independence. This was not good for psychiatry. This was not good for mental health care. Lots of stuff got destroyed. In 1963, Nathan Klein, an American psychiatry, visits a sister of 32 psychiatrists. The country was not doing well economically. Electroshock therapy was given straight out of the electrical socket, no machines. There was hardly any psychopharmacology, except if private patients could afford it. But nonetheless, a relatively free vision from colonial times still prevailed. There were no locked doors. Patients were free to go. Patients would go outdoors. There was lots of occupational therapy in the workshops and in the gardens. This started to diminish when Boa grew and people in the city thought, what are these people doing in a city? We wish our streets to be clean of that. Then restrictions came in. Nathan Klein, who had been in Indonesia, sent his student, Robert Rubin, in 1964, who bought, brought two suitcases with Thorazine and an electroshock machine. He also had some made some rare pictures. This is Suharto Heerchan, the city mental hospital in Jakarta, which at the time was still a rather rural environment. This, of course, as we now know, is no longer the case, but it looks quite nice. Here we see some of the leading psychiatrists at the time. This is Kusumanto up front, Didi Bakhtiar, the leading psychoanalyst in Indonesia. This is at the University of Indonesia Medical School. And again, almost same position, Didi Bakhtiar and Kusumanto Setiyanagoro. In the 70s, the fate of Indonesian psychiatry changed quite a bit. Kusumanto had a triple position of being the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Indonesia, director of the Directorate of Mental Health in the Ministry of Health. And he is considered the godfather of Indonesian psychiatry. He collected a generation of young psychiatrists. He sent them abroad for further education, placed them really well, and gave an enormous boost to psychiatry in Indonesia. This photo is a couple of years ago. This was his private mental hospital, the sanatorium Dama Wangsa, um, where I had the honor to interview him. Now, his view, Kusumanda's view, on mental health care was a focus on mental hospitals. He felt there should be one in every province in Indonesia. His view was not limited to mental hospitals, but he said from the mental hospital, we should have public health education, educating general practitioners, provide consultation in general hospitals. So mental health care would radiate from every mental hospital. Mental hospitals would also focus on rehabilitation and open outpatient clinics. At this time, Kusumanto and Indonesian psychiatrists had leading roles in ASEAN, providing how, how mental health care should be organized in Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia. It was quite prominent. Now, I don't want to say that since then, mental health care has declined, but a leader like Kusumanto, we haven't quite had. Mental health care best practice. This is to build on Pusumanto's legacy, that is to provide mental health care in a variety of settings, in hospitals, in the community, in the Puskesmas. The new health insurance system in Indonesia wants mental health care to, prefer, to be provided in primary care settings, so in the Puskesmas. This is a form of community mental health. This is also the policies of the World Health Organization. It is a fantastic idea, but nobody really knows exactly how to go about this in Indonesia, although there are many, many proposals. In addition, recent trends in mental health care worldwide say, say let's focus on patient need rather than diagnosis. Let's focus on recovery, on abilities, uh, rather than focusing on mental illness and limitations. Also, Let's look for an involvement of other professions, such as the community mental health nurse, social workers, and the patient or consumer groups. And in Indonesia, there are many very active groups that do fantastic work. KPSE, the Indonesian Schizophrenia Care Community, Bipolar Care Indonesia, Into the Light. Because there's such a severe shortage of psychiatrists in Indonesia today, 
less than a thousand, a population of around 270 million. I think mental health care would need all assistance it can get and involving the community groups is a great idea. This is the vision of Dr. Pandu Setia One, who was connected to the Ministry of Health for quite a long time. Unfortunately, he is no longer with us. And in my own work in Indonesia, we had a project and visions on the future of mental health care. And a two volume work came out of that on the future of mental health care in Indonesia. More than 50 Indonesian collaborators. And also some of this is also summarized in an online journal called Inside Indonesia, where you can check some of these ideas out. To summarize, Dutch East Indies and Indonesia have leading mental health care systems in the past. This is no longer the case, but there is a great amount of ideas and initiatives that could be realized and implemented in the very short term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Um, I love hearing about the legacy of uh, Kusumanto and also um, Pandu Stiawan, of course, um, who was sadly missed. And I, I do love hearing also about the history of the, the heyday of Indonesian psychiatry in the, from the 1960s up until the 1980s. And I wonder, sort of reflecting on, on Nova's presentation also, what happened uh, between 1980 and, and, and now in terms of Indonesia being one of the leaders in terms of mental health care systems reform in, in Asia and, and a, a shining light for the, for the world even. And then, and then maybe, well, obviously things changed. Maybe we can talk a, bit, a little bit about that later as well. Um, I want to invite to the screen now um, Mas Anto uh, SG. Now Mas Anto is, he has, he has many hats. He's a researcher, he's an advocate, he's a survivor, and he's a fantastic artist. He's a member, well, should I say in terms of, we might get Hans to stand up here and, and do a little bit of a twirl actually in, ter in terms of his art, he's, he does art, um, around Batik as well as some other areas and you might have to come closer Hans because you're a bit blurry come there we go we can we can kind of see your 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 I am Batik this is one of one of Anto's classic classic Batik works that he does a whole series for for, for um but Hans so other than being an artist, he is also a member of numerous peer group support um, networks. Um, Hans has talked about a few of those in his talk, but um, well, he's, I think he's, he's already mentioned Kapi SE, which um, is a community care for schizophrenia organisation that Masantoa is part of. He's part of also Bipolar Care Indonesia. He received the Human Rights Jim Burley Award in 2016. Um, and an Australian Awards Fellowship and Scholarship also in 2016 to support his Masters in Health Promotion, which he has completed now at Deakin University. Uh, Masanto is going to talk about his personal journey and also a little bit about the consumer groups movement in Indonesia. Hi everyone, it's been an honour for me to be invited and speaking in this forum. I'm going to explain some of introduction on my topic, which is a personal experience about Pasung and how the survivor group in Indonesia try to begin the advocacy and the movement in mental health. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Anto Agusuki Anto. I'm a mental health activist. I experience uh, a very hard time dealing with the mental health issue at that time, and I experience Pasung, so I'm a Pasung survivor and I also volunteered in many uh, advocacies and many uh, consumer movement in Indonesia and I became the now is the executive committee of uh, global mental health peer network uh, in Indonesia. It's for the full, full story of my uh, journey how I experienced the mental health issues and how I end up in chained in the government facilities in the year around uh, 99 you can see all of my full story in youtube uh, it's already released into a documentary movie which is a collaboration uh, my collaboration with the dr emilia Colucci, who invited me to share my story and make it into a documentary movie so for this full story you can uh, we can access this movie through YouTube. A little bit recap on my story. 
it was started when I had the depression time and I was depressed because I lost my dream when I was unable to make a balance between working and studying then I was trying to be an English teacher but I failed then I got dropped out from my campus because I was unable to pay the tuition and I had no support from anywhere because I was by myself my family uh, couldn't afford to put me in a college or in a campus so it was all by myself then I was blaming myself for uh, had this lost my dream then I was entering into a depression time without knowing there was a depression I should have have been uh, a consultation with the psychologist and taken to the right medication but no at the time we just follow what 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 the suggestion from my neighbor and my family just took me into this facility which is a Gahon facility it's a primary health care in another cities but in this primary health care they put all of the people with mental illness or the patients into the chaining practice which is all the patient being chained in in the bed in the bed for about one month I had this experience I had to take the medication it was I was given the medication for schizophrenia because they just uh, put my diagnosis with schizophrenia which is no it is not uh, a proper exam it was not a proper examination without any consultation or yes it was I was mistreated a misdiagnosed and taken the wrong medication yeah it, it was about my story how I end up this uh, for me and it was the hardest period of time in my life where I experienced the illness and the stigma uh, mental illness because I had this depression and and wrong medication and wrong diagnosis and the stigma happened after I released was released from this facility when I try to come back to my home my house in the village where everyone tried to avoid me where everyone start change their how they interact with me they avoid me they just disregard me they called me crazy and and finally it was uh, giving a hard period of in my life when I tried to run away from the feel it because of the shame and the guilt because I was feeling my own self stigma I felt the shame and dishonor, and dishonor because people see me unequal to them it was a real uh, uh, end of the world for me so it was a hard and later did I know I found that many evidence, many research, many studies mentioned that the stigma does create collateral damage to the patient itself. Where WHO also mentioned that it was the the stigma is the largest barriers to the treatment, which it's true. It was true. Uh, this, if I was not being stigmatized, I would have already been able to recover more quickly and more uh, and and it was just it should be not that, that as hard as that I was experienced so so then the stigma is everywhere in the society even in ourselves now in this time for everyone who's not aware that mental illness uh, in and the stigma is is really act is does exist because for example people saw the news people see people with mental illness uh, is related to the cruelty related to the uh, lack of faith related to the uh, bad interaction negative interaction with uh, with the uh, with the people with schizophrenia for example and we saw being brainwashed by the media by the hollywood movie that everyone who's become the villain is people with mental illness so so this is the truth I would like to uh, emphasize that stigma create negative impacts uh, as, as, we can, as what we can see now the cases of stigmatization 
does more harm than the mental illness itself because because stigmatization leads to the abandonment ignorance people are unable to access don't want to access the medication because of the stigma end up in chaining and shackling and suicide so so the study explain all about that my recovery process is a very hard period as well it was a long journey when i had my ups and downs if i can resume that i combine holistically the essential part of recovery and stuff like uh, self medication self motivation introspection acceptance resilience medical treatment support peer support and community support community support i also uh, educate others to do with the stigma because in indonesia we have a lot of challenges there are a lot of lack of services high cap treatments a lot of cases of chaining we still have a uh, numbers of chaining which is it mentioned 20,000, 18,000 and some human rights report are even mentioned more than that it, it, it's still a massive number and uh, the passion movement and initiative I finally joined a lot of uh, patients uh, consumer groups and peer support because I found and we found and knew that it can uh, it can uh, promote the recovery process so it helped me to find a lot of information as done as well place where i can be accepted for what uh, we are because there were no there is no uh, stigma among us this is the uh, indonesian consumer group where they join indonesian community care for indonesia uh, for schizophrenia bipolar care indonesia harmony and diversity and we have a lot of uh, uh, progress when we have this mental health law which we advocate with uh, Dr. Noriu. I'm sure she's the one who's also present in this uh, forum. And we finally had this mental health law in Indonesia. And we have a lot of initiative which is the Into the Light, the Suicide Prevention by Dollar by Borderline Personality Disorder Group the motherhood indonesia where we have this group for uh, uh, mother who had depression postpartum depression group so that was my introduction and uh, so for more detail i'm going to share on the event how i survived from pasung and finally became a mental health activist raising the awareness and erasing the stigma People with mental illness is a human who deserves equal respect because we are human. Mental illness is not something to be ashamed of, but we should be ashamed of the stigma itself. So that's the quote from the Bill Clinton and see you at the event. Thank you so much, Marzanto, for that, that introduction. I think we're going to go also to this discussion hour and we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about your own experience. And I also really want to hear more about Cape SE and bipolar care and some details around those consumer movements. So I think we'll have time a little bit later. So I'm now, we're now joined, I can see here, uh, Dr. Aminia Kalucci is also joined us and she is going to, well, her, herself and um, Dr. Ade, Prastani, better known as Baasti. They are a collaborative who've also worked with the Center for Public Mental Health. So we've also got here, you can see uh, Dr. Diana Stiawati in, in the beautiful purple. She's managed to take her mask off. She's actually currently at Parliament House at Jogjakarta at the moment, and she's got a private room so she doesn't have to cover up, which is fantastic. So this fantastic um, collaboration has been creating some amazing films on mental health. Um, I honestly, honestly get goosebumps when I'm actually talking to you about this because some of the experiential stuff of course they've made a film about Anto's experience which you can click on in the link um, that we've provided in the chat system um, but some of the newer stuff at the moment is is fiddling with the idea of this unhappy marriage between Western psychiatric discourses and the traditional healing um, world in Indonesia and, and and how that works so this is a bit of a snippet from their new film upcoming film which I'm not sure when it's going to come out I'm sure that they'll tell us all about it very soon um, and we're going to show it live here today 
today. If you do have any problems in terms of buffering, it's a little bit heavier than some of our other recordings. So we are providing a link again in the chat box, just in case you want to kind of mute us off and watch it directly on your screen as well, in case it's not coming down the line um, really well for you. So I'm going to welcome to the screen the beautiful work that has um, been a combination of huge amounts of time, I'm sure, because making audio visual stuff, I can't even imagine, but it takes extraordinary blood, sweat and tears. So I want to welcome them to the, to the stage with this, this product of their upcoming film. Thank you, Dr. Amenia and um, Baasti, and also uh, Dr. Diana Stiawati. Thank you. Thank you. Kalau saya mempelajari hampir semua orang percaya kita mempunyai roh sehingga kita itu bisa memahami orang tidak harus melihatnya tapi merasakan energi pun bisa dan dari sini kita bisa melihat bahwa pasien tidak selalu harus ditangani secara fisik secara mental tetapi juga dengan pendekatan spiritual ini e, sebenarnya tidak bisa dipungkiri bahwa pasien-pasien e, di gangguan jiwa ini sangat lekat dengan pengobatan tradi pengobat tradisional biasanya pasien itu akan bertanya ketika kita menjalani sesi-sesi terapi Dok, e, boleh nggak kami e, ruyah misalnya? Biasanya saya memotivasinya begini, wong sakit fisik saja, orang dengan penyakit fisik saja mendapatkan doa, mendapatkan dukungan ya e, spiritual itu saja akan e, baik gitu. Tapi tetap sesi-sesi terapi kita jalani. Kalau Pasien membutuhkan obat juga obat tetap diminum rutin. Nah, ketika ketemu dengan uh, kiai atau peru ya uh, ini doa doa, dikir dan sebagainya itu pasti akan uh, menguatkan itu. Nah, biasanya kalau sudah saya menyampaikan bahwa tidak pernah ada yang melarang ruyah ya dan sebagainya, uh, pasien akan tanya siapa ya dok itu di antara yang mungkin dokter tahu itu yang e, dokter rekomendasikan kebetulan e, Ustaz Fadlan salah satu yang e, saya kenal saya pernah berdialog lah dengan beliau ya jadi paling tidak sudah jadi lebih paham karena beberapa kali pernah apa diskusi gitu أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم آتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تحزنا يوم القيامة سميع الدعاء اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا كما في وفاتك رسلنا والحمد لله رب العالمين What are you feeling? Gimana rasanya sekarang? Lebih lega. Ya? Lebih lega. Semua penyakit tekanan batin mempengaruhi orang lain. Maka berdoa, berdoalah meminta ketenangan itu. Eh memang seperti dengi tombo-tombo one tilu lihat tombo-tombo tidak bisa tidur ngaji lihat reveng itu tombo-tombo itu jadi supaya bisa kendalikan biasanya langsung vale-vale to tombo-tombo ya. 
sentuhan touching itu membantu membantu rupanya mungkin saraf-saraf saya juga tidak tahu saya tidak bisa tapi ini misteri saya merasa bahwa sentuhan itu membantu touch kasih di situ saya merasa bahwa kasih Tuhan pakai tangan saya untuk mendoakan mereka Tuhan Yesus engkau menumpangkan tangan dan berkatmu mengalir atas putrimu ini Ketika saya percaya bahwa kekuatan penyembuhan dari atas terjadi, biasanya saya katakan, oke, okay, ini bisa sampai di sini, tapi kalau makin berat saya, oke, dalam nama Bapa dan Amin. Terima jauhlah kami dari bahaya perang, penyakit, dan segala kejahatan. Pandangan mereka bahwa saya akan sembuh dengan dengan berdoa, dengan melakukan acara-acara dan adat-adat spiritual jika terlalu tinggi kita akan susah masuk untuk bicara tentang gejala sisofrenia <gak> obat ini bisa membuat pasien ini stabil itu mereka tidak percaya harus ada medium antara yang spiritual dengan yang medis diantara itu tuh yang kami butuhkan itu adalah para medium ini para Pastor, para pendoa, para dukun, para orang pintar di kampung-kampung, para tokoh agama Datang ke kami bersama dengan pasien Supaya kita bisa diskusi Pemahaman si ajengan itu bahwa di diri saya itu ada jin. Nah dari situ saya tuh dirukia. Semua santri dan ustad duduk melingkar dan saya di tengah-tengah dan mereka ngaji untuk saya supaya si jin di dalam tubuh saya itu menghilang. Dua minggu berobat di situ tapi nggak sembuh-sembuh. Nah, ustad-ustad itu mereka bingung. Ini penyakit apa gitu. Dan akhirnya si ustad itu minta bantuan ke pihak yayasan KSC. Ada khas yang kami lakukan di sini adalah satu sama lain itu semua harus saling membantu kakak ngasuh adik sesama ODGJ tidak ada di sini perawat profesional boleh dicek tidak ada dokter yang khusus setiap hari standby mengawasi nggak ada. Merawat ODGJ adalah oleh ODGJ itu sendiri. Ini rumah keluarga. Saya ingin mencoba pendekatan yang berbeda bahwa sebenarnya ini tergantung kliennya, klien center kan. Jadi kalau dia mempercaya itu saya berusaha menggiringnya pada hal yang ramah juga. Apalagi syukur-syukur membantu untuk penyembuhannya. Tapi kalau dia tidak percaya, ya tentu saya tidak menyarankan. Jadi sebenarnya sesimpel itu, saya bukan orang, jadi soal saya kan tidak penting, soal terapisnya atau pemahaman kepercayaan, terapisnya kan tidak penting. Gitu. Ketika yang ketemu dengan dia pertama kali, sudah melihat pikiran dan lain sebagainya menerawang apa yang bisa tiang lakukan komunikasi yang pertama dia ajak ngomong sehingga tiang masuk pelan-pelan ke kehidupannya dia ternyata di sana ada beban psikologis yang dia alami tadi sebenarnya itu sebuah prosesi upacara ritual tetapi bahasa kerennya hipnotis supaya pikiran di bawah sadarnya keluh kesah yang ada dalam dirinya dia luangkan dalam luapan emosi tersebut
kita tidak bisa berbicara ni skala aja tanpa bantuan skala. Oleh sebab itu, tiang bersihkan dulu ni loh, tiang lukat dia, tiang mandikan dia dengan air suci dan lain sebagainya. Setelah ini berlangsung, tiang lihat sudah aura uh, cakra atau dalam dirinya itu sudah mulai membaik. Baru tiang akan ketemukan dengan doktor psikolog. Salah satunya adalah doktor Rai. Tunduk, 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 tunduk. Rumah baru, rumah baru. Kita ngaji, kita ngaji. Putuslah Romi yang kudus Tuhan. Barulah tubuhnya, jiwanya dan rohnya. Ampunilah segala dosa dan kesalannya. Sekiranya ada kejahatan atau kuasa gelapan yang menimpa dia, semoga Romi yang kudus menghalau dan menghancurkan kejahatan itu. Dan tangan yang maha kuasa. Membebaskan hamba ini dari segala kejahatan dan kuasa kelapan. Dalam rampa perang kita harus kudus. Semoga Tuhan beserta kita. Salam salam. Makan kue, pisang goreng atau apa? Mana mama yang terima? Mama yang terima? Mama sini. Naik bat. Ini masih yang keluarga di dalam rumah. Neneknya. Ini neneknya. Ya, terima kasih kepada ibu perawat nih, dia sudah membantu mendamping obat dia sama. Kami juga berterima kasih karena keluarga yang kami layani juga bekerja sama dengan baik. Thank you, Together for Mental Health. Um, I forgot before to to read out some of the the accolades of our amazing um, trio that produced this particular product. Um, so, Dr. Aminia uh, Kalucci is an associate professor in visual and cultural psychology, Department of Psychology at Middlesex University in the UK, and a registered clinical and community psychologist in Italy. Her main expertise is in cultural and global mental health, applied cross-cultural psychology, and visual anthropology in low and middle income countries, immigrant and refugee populations. Aminia is passionate about using arts-based visual methods in her research, teaching advocacy, and Dr. Ade uh, Prastani, I have so much trouble calling you Ade Prastani because I know so I know you so well as Asti is a research fellow for also for Together for Mental Health. Um, she is currently um, based in uh, Jakarta. I hear she has been backwards and forwards between Jakarta and Jakarta as COVID has permitted. She's a medical doctor by training. Um, from the received her degree from Universitas Indonesia in 2010. She's completed a postgraduate degree from ANU in culture, health and medicine. Currently, she is supporting the World Bank on Indonesia's COVID vaccination program and social action plans. Now we're going to turn to a brief talk by Dr. Diana Stiawati, who is going, who is the director of the Center for Public Mental Health, CPMH, which many of you have are already very familiar with as a fantastic organization does an amazing advocacy work and is connected with a whole host of people throughout the world. Um, specifically, Diana herself um, has a PhD from the University of Melbourne. She was supported by the DFAT Australian um, Awards Hadi Sast 
uh, Solsastro Prize. She completed her PhD in 2014 and has been recognized for outstanding achievements in mental health systems, strengthening advocacy and training. She's going to speak to you from an academic pedestal, which is not a very high pedestal um, working as the director of CPMHA because you are continually doing Pengabdian Masyarakat and huge amounts of work um, at, at the community level for systems change in mental health. So um, I invite our last speaker to the screen um, for her, her recorded presentation. We're going to go a little bit over that hour. And um, I want to thank Dr. Diana Stiawati for the last presentation. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Diana Stiawati. I'm the director of the Center for Public Mental Health, Faculty of Psychology, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. And today I will discuss about how the Center for Public Mental Health having a role in uh, building a mental health system in Indonesia. So basically, uh, this they want to contribute to build a comprehensive mental health system in Indonesia. <coughs> and our vision is the overall well-being of the Indonesian population built up on the nation's strength potential as well as intersectoral public policy supported by relevant professions based on scientific evidence. <coughs> what are the fundamental problems of the Indonesian mental health system? We believe the root is actually mental health literacy that leading to stigma, neglect, and also partial uh, uh, concern about mental health. And that makes uh, our mental health system also uh, having low resources because it is not uh, become a priority for a national development program. Then make uh, make the most of the part in Indonesia, yeah, maybe only in Java that they have a good mental health uh, service, yeah, not really, not really, not really uh, well established, but started to have it. Uh, <coughs> because we have a psychiatrist, psychologist, and that other mental health professional mostly in Java, but in the other part of Indonesia, we will see untreated, underdiagnosed, and partial concern. And also uh, people and us in mental health system in Indonesia think that mental health is only about uh, uh, what to call the managing people with mental illness, yeah. Not yet about promotion, about uh, prevention to make uh, to, or to increase the well being of the nation. Uh, what the center believe about the uh, be the key element of a comprehensive mental health system? Uh, we believe that it should be a, a kind of comprehensive look on and comprehensive building of individual, family, school or workplace, community, and government policy. So what we do basically, uh, we uh, do this uh, strengthening mental health workforce and increase access to mental health care by placing psychologists into primary health care, which is uh, currently only in some district in Java that it is happen, yeah. And then we also do family strength. We build a family strength, we promote through a policy and uh, also program and then school based mental health and we also work on community priority issues such as suicide prevention common mental health uh, of course the post disaster mental health is also important and the root is the mental health literacy the ongoing research that uh, <clears throat> we are currently doing is the using collaborative visual research methods to understand experience of mental illness, coercion, and restraint in Ghana and Indonesia. Uh, basically, we try to see or cover uh, to, uh, to see the case studies in Indonesia where actually most of the Indonesian are going or seeking help if they have mental health problem and spiritual healer is one of the a key element, and we try to capture how spiritual healer can collaborate with the uh, mental health professional. So uh, if that happened, 
spiritual healer become a, an asset uh, to strengthen mental health system. Uh, the other uh, research that we are conducting now is the impact of COVID-19 on people with psychosocial disabilities, especially people with uh, severe uh, mental illness. That's the ongoing research. And we are also doing a research about strong families surviving the pandemic, how uh, a family strength or how strong family can survive in this kind of difficult situation. We are currently also working with Ministry of Health, uh, mapping of Indonesian mental health system, uh, uh, what is potential protective and uh, risk factor in, in, in the people too in Indonesia. So we do hope that uh, after this research, we can uh, have a good portrait about mental health system in Indonesia and can have a good recommendation for a national strategic for strengthening mental health. What we do is uh, we're doing the systematic literature review, focus group discussion, interview with uh, the whole Indonesian uh, district health office, and then we do survey to the population and also analyzing the in Indonesian family life survey data. Uh, this among the publication that we uh, have uh, re related to primary healthcare in the uh, psychologists in the primary healthcare, uh, yeah, still a unit cost of primary healthcare psychologists, and then this uh, our public publication with Aliza about evaluating the Indonesian repassing in Kebumen, and then it is uh, related to school based mental health, and we also produce guidelines such as. Uh, Kampus Sejahtera, Sekolah Sejahtera, also Suicide Prevention. And uh, we do the ongoing advocacy of strengthening family, uh, school-based mental health and comprehensive mental health system through Yogyakarta, Kebumen, and also national level. And I think this is the network that we have with all the friends and colleagues yeah, support us yeah, with uh, expert knowledge. Yeah, uh, and these are our activities roughly. Uh, we do training seminar, but mostly we do advocacy through research and, and training as well. And we do lots of uh, discussion with the uh, government. And currently we are having many projects uh, with government, uh, we can say that we become a partner in various things, such as uh, from uh, making a law, local law, or uh, mapping a mental health system, and also doing independent research to produce guideline and recommendation for the government. I think that's all. Thank you very much uh, for. Uh, your attention. I hope this uh, can illustrate yeah, what the Center for Public Mental Health is. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you so much, Bultiana. There's a smorgasbord of activities that Chapeem are obviously involved in, and I'm sure that there, there might be some questions around that as well. We've only got a couple of questions at the moment in the Q&A box, and I invite everyone at the moment to sort of type out some questions or feel free also to raise your hand and um, we'll sort of take groups of three for the questions. I know there's been some talk, a little bit of talk in the chat box um, around some around, first of all, we were talking a little bit about, for those who weren't following, we were talking a little bit about the transition from the 1980s um, into the current mental, uh, the current um, modern mental health system in Indonesia and some of the challenges around that. And then the, then the, um, then the discussion turned a little bit more to issues around LGBTQIA, plus I'm not sure where we're at with that. I'm, I'm not an expert in the area by any means, but I'm wondering, Maybe while we're waiting for some more questions and hands to raise, if there's anyone else who might have some comments from the panel um, around some of these, this is a very tricky issue. It's a very sensitive issue. Um, and I, I, 
don't, I invite people to speak only if you feel comfortable to speak about this issue, but it is something that needs to be touched on and talked about in terms of issues around people's subjectivity and mental health in Indonesia. Would anyone from the panel like to add anything or open the discussion a little bit more? Sorry, I was temporarily distracted. What uh, would you like me to address? Happy to do so. We were just talking a little bit about, about the LGBTQIA plus community in Indonesia. And uh, I think we had a GP who was talking yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, about, yeah, yeah. about some of the concerns around, <laughs> around that area and wondering what are some of the issues that need to be considered and um, maybe some different approaches from different organisational perspectives around the issue. This is a very difficult and sensitive issue in Indonesia, especially since in 2018, some politicians launched a war against LGBT. Some generals said that, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, a nuclear bomb is preferable over lesbian and gay people uh, because they do more damage now. Politicians worldwide like to saw the vision, like to foster stigma, and like to create this types of enemies to, for their own advantage. And this is deplorable worldwide. We know the very severe effects that stigma has on people with a variety of mental illnesses. Stigma, social exclusion, I think it's a cancer on society. It makes things so much worse. We should aspire, all of us, Australia, Indonesia, everywhere, to have an inclusive society that is accepting, and we should have the moral fortitude to say, throwing division, stigmatizing people, we should abolish. Now, for, uh, and Nova can say maybe a bit about the Indonesian Psychiatric Association, uh, it uh, is debating, thinking of falling out with uh, the international standards, uh, being less, being gay, whatever, is not a mental diagnosis, it, it's not a psychiatric diagnosis, there's no evidence for this. Um, I think uh, in recent psychiatry should just uh, openly acknowledge this. Look, the political climate is difficult. I know this, um, but uh, I think we should address this in a way that this in the Indonesian context will be effective. Now, how exactly to do that? I'm an outsider. I don't quite know. And I know that lots of people are concerned about these issues, um, but uh, it's, it's a fear to speak out very regrettable but in the current political atmosphere yes there is a, a fear to call the spade a spade i i think uh Woodyana, you might want to say something a little bit about this issue maybe not specific about this issue but the stigma the the root of all of this thing is uh mental health literacy is i think the big uh, uh the root of everything yeah and also, since currently we are working with the Ministry of Health for mapping the mental health system in Indonesia, we, uh, I really like sad to hear that all around the Indonesia, actually the inequality uh, like exists. Uh, you can imagine in some, uh, in Sleiman, for example, the one where Kajah Mada University is there, we have 25 uh, clinical psychologists, 35 clinical psychologists working in 25 uh, puskesmas, primary health care, with all the program from promotion, prevention, and uh, all uh, everything, uh, family, school, uh, babies, everything. And when we uh, talk to people in Sleman, for, they are politician, they are not really politician, but they are officer, not only in health sector, we do really, I can feel that their mental health is, literacy is like very, very high compared to their uh, uh, counterpart from other places like uh, Sinjai, for example, where they only have 11 puskesmas. So uh, a person need to go there to the puskesmas like six hours to, to, to get access and then uh, among the 11 primary health care, only one GP uh, ever heard about mental health care uh, being trained. And what they do if, uh, what they will do if there is a mental health problem, they will wait for a chance 
to refer this person from Puskesmas to uh, Rumah Sakit Jiwa to mental hospital, which is in Pontianak, uh, means like 10 hours, uh, yeah, 10 hours uh, car by cars, and the Dinsos only have four times a year to uh, to uh, for the budget for uh, referring people from the district to that. Uh, Kota Pontiana. So things like that, like really, actually the root of all the problem, where the stigma exists, everything, uh, we really suffering uh, inequality everywhere. Yeah, thank you. I think we might throw it open to the audience for now. Before we go to, I think, um, Emmy also, uh, Dr. Minia also has a um, a bit of a, a bit of a um, request of of Matt Nova to talk a little bit more about the suicide prevention guidelines. But before I do that, I might just let's just go to the Q and A box, and I'm wondering, can we um, live in the background there? Can, can we um, possibly unmute um, uh, Paya Stiti Kafani? Sorry about my pronunciation, my on my off. So we've got a question. I'll read out this question. Uh, this is Dr. Fani from Bali. Thank you very much um, for this question to, to Dr. Nova. In, in Indonesia, there is a gap between mental health care services that's covered by government and private sector. Patients can't have enough time to do consultations with doctors if they are using the national health insurance, the Jaminan Kesahata National BPJS. Is there a strategy to solve this problem? Okay. Uh... Thank you for the question, Dr. Fani from Bali. Uh, the gap is, of course, convenience. Private mental health service is convenient but expensive. Not many um, private health insurance is willing to cover for the expenses. But however, benefits are durations of consultation and range of treatment option. So not only medicines, but forms of psychotherapy. Uh, however, the government Mental health service, if you are registered to the JKN or our social health insurance system, for as far as I know in Jakarta, it does offer uh, a different form of convenience. And that is, you don't pay out of pocket, yet you feel the benefit from the installment that you pay regularly as participant of JKN. So, um, well, despite I was in the parliament more in the past 10 years than in practice, I did my practice in the mental hospital in Jakarta, Suharto Herjan, for, uh, for two years. So I know the limited time uh, to give to the outpatients um, with so many daily patients and massive paperwork and also having to do input to the computer information system. Hence, um, the hospital also provides services of clinical psychologists. Usually, the psychiatrist will refer to a clinical psychologist should there be an indication. Um, and also, there is a maximum limit for uh, dispensing medicines if you use JKN. However, there are setbacks. It is uh, very possible there are two opposite regulations. Uh, for instance, between the Ministry of Health uh, and regional office of social health insurance administration body. Uh, one of them experienced uh, in Western Jakarta, where I practice, was to decide indication for rehabilitative program uh, being covered by the social health insurance. Psychiatrists, I think, according to the Ministry of Health regulation, is, uh, are able to decide instead of being uh, restricted by the regional JKN uh, regulation. And during the World Mental Health Day just a few days ago, I was panelist with, the, with Hans Pauls and also official from the Ministry of Health. And he shared that seven out of 10 people do not know the JKN can cover the cost of accessing and also treating mental health services. And three, of, uh, uh, three out of 10 people do not know if there are mental health services in their domicile area. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, Aliza? I'm wondering if there's anyone else who's got anything to add to that from the panel. Yeah, actually, I, I would like to respond about the why the mental health issue is hard to advocate. I think based on my own experience and the community 
support group that I joined, we are finding that the stigma is what uh, become the challenge of all. That's what makes it so hard to advocate because government see that the issue is not as a priority because I've been involved in the uh, advocacy in Panton because we talked to the uh, budgeting uh, department and we call it Papeta and we are trying to advocate and as far as I know after that not much can be done and there is not much result on that so the stigma is there and the lack of uh, lack of support from the government is also the problem and the second is about the the gap services that what can be done on or help the patient to get the more information I think this is where the role of the peer support group can can be involved can be empowered because as far as i know the group like uh, rumah berdaya in, for example in bali as as it's been pictured in the in the the movie they and in this community we get a lot of information and if we want to ask about our condition there are there are psychi psychiatrists some psychologists and we can have a lot of access on that and yeah i think i can add that so we can we can do something about the community support group and peer support group involvement and also in empowerment of people living the experience for the benefit of us thank you i'm wondering if anyone else has got some something to add in terms about the issues around advocacy of course this is an issue that every that touches everyone in the panel and probably m most of the people in the audience from from the list of names i'm wondering if maybe we'll go to the panelists first and if you can speak a little bit about some of the challenges in advocacy for mental health maybe specifically in indonesia but maybe more broadly and then maybe if there's any of the audience that wants to share anything as well we do invite you to either if you're, you're not comfortable to raise your hand and participate by unmuting your, your microphone when we ask you to, then please participate in the chat box and get involved and let us know and we'll read out some of those, those things that we're talking about if we get a discussion going. So um, is there anyone from the panel who wants to, wants to add anything about advocacy at the moment? Emmy, please. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you for organizing this event and lovely to see some of my friends here uh, today and uh, um, also in the chat. Uh, just adding, I guess, some of the challenges, but also some of the things we can do um, in a more positive note. I, I, I think uh, also through my work in other uh, countries uh, beyond Indonesia, one of the main issues here around stigma and advocacy um, for mental health in general is also which kind of discourse we promote. So what I notice a lot is when then there are campaigns that what that's a stigma. The kind of message given is a mental mental illness is like any any other any other um, illness. Uh, very much promoting a, a, a strong biomedical approach to mental health, which I think is also very dangerous because it's, it's a very uh, unidirectional. And it is also potentially um, assuming that having a, a, a schizophrenia, depression, or the diagnosis is like having diabetes or an, an, a heart issue. And I think it's a lot of danger in this kind of promotion. So the balance is, uh, I guess, uh, how can we promote uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, obviously the uh, um, diminish the, the discrimination towards people with mental illness without pushing so much for a biomedical uh, approach which as is pitiful as we can discuss later and um, some other way to go about it i uh, i think very important to be aware of is that, that the research tells us that exposure to people uh, who have experience with mental health issues. For example, Antos in his work in other organization in Indonesia, which are very active in terms of uh, speaking about their experience, also what has helped them, what's been unhelpful. It's actually very important in terms of helping people familiarizing themselves with actually what a person with a mental health diagnosis, my, my mental illness diagnosis might actually look like, what it might be like, and diminishing the, the potentially the misconception about about it. So I think more opportunity for the public to actually be exposed uh, is fundamental. And I really commend on, on the work that Anto is doing and others in Indonesia, where actually the country is leading uh, uh, this kind of uh, lived experience um, advocacy very much for the rest of Asia and I would say for the rest of many other low income countries, low middle income countries. Yeah, uh, from our uh, experience in advocacy, 
if we come to the government and we are talking directly about mental health, they only think about mental illness sometimes. And sometimes the resistance coming like, oh, we only have a small number of people with mental illness in our uh, area, something like that. But uh, we learn that we uh, start to uh, talk about uh, ad advocacy from the angle of family, for example, or school. That will be more. Uh, they they will accept the the resistance like uh, like not no not there anymore, and they are welcome with all of this issue and how we can uh, use this as a door for uh, further advocacy, something like that, Aliza. Is there anything else that any of the panels want to add? It is not. Oh, okay. yeah. if Oh, yeah, Dr. Nova, I'm going to go. No, 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 no. Uh, you go, you go first. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so to just jump in on uh, the excellent uh, description uh, by, by all the panelists about uh, the challenges in advocacy. And I think this also relates <laughs> to uh, the sensitive questions about uh, gender identity and, and uh, the, the collective groups of, of marginalized communities that uh, one of the lessons that, that, that uh, we, we have on the field is especially what we see in Pasung advocacy as well as well. So if it's not talked about and counted, it's uh, an issue that is not addressed. So if we uh, keep, uh, you know, a, a group of populations, their humanities and the complexity of their lives hidden, it's not addressed. And I think that is one of the big issues in advocacy uh, for the marginalized. And secondly, also. Uh, after advocating, we need to know how to move uh, forward with actions that are, uh, you know, actionable uh, programs. So, and it, it refers also to the uh, public system of, of uh, programs and and uh, uh, and institutions having roles. So, if it is not counted, so there is no representation. Uh, and it is not detailed in the budget items and and, and uh, programs. It is not actionable. So I think those two uh, representation and also budgeting and governance, those are those are uh, the, the big issues in advocacy, uh, including in mental health, and, but also in other uh, issues that are still not addressed in Indonesia. Maybe that's what I can add for now. I think we might change tack for a moment. I think we've got a, um, a live question from the audience. Uh, Patricia, Shintha, would you like to unmute your microphone now and, and ask your question to Mas Anto? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for the all panelists. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Anto, I have heard about your amazing story yeah? and it is not easy to break the stigma. And then I, as I know you make a beautiful batik. Uh, could you please tell me how did you start working by batik while also using batik as a campaign media against stigma in mental health? Thank you. Thank you. Should I directly answer this? Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, yep. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to also like uh, to declare like that it's never been easy to be a mental health activist based on life experience, especially exposing yourself to your story that you've been in chain or passung. So it's never been easy until at this moment. But mm -hmm. I, I feel like uh, this is my duty to to speak. Because if nobody wants to speak, who's going to speak about this? Although my pasung is not the same pasung that experienced by people who've in the remote island that been cast away in the near the forest and it put in the hill, but at least I know what it felt to be in chain. So that's why I committed myself to this advocacy. So yes, the advocacy is about relentlessly action, and not just the advocacy but also the action. That's why I use all means to to do the advocacy, to use the advocacy, my artwork, my skills. It began when I actually I have some talent in art. I design, I do painting. So my my mother is is a batik uh, batik making. So she do the hand handmade batik. So I I at first I sketch some batik. Just to yeah, just to make an art. So, so as a media to campaign, uh, that's at the end of the and at, at my end the journey of the advocacy when I asked to speak in one of the conference in 
like a psychiatric conference in Indonesia in one of the events. So they asked me, do you have anything to show like us that you have some art? Then then I bring my part and yeah, some of them are being auctioned to be sold and to be donated to KPSC. That's how it was started. Then then finally I think I'm more comfortable with the designing this party because I design and I empower my neighbor. Actually, it's not just my I am the one who's doing it, but actually I uh, approach my neighbor, which which part of them they also part of them who's being who's stigmatized me, but I approach them to you know this is mean as, as a media to campaign as a media that at least I can do this uh, design so my neighbor help me so it's it a bit by a bit it erasing the stigma between me and my neighbor who's now is like my co-worker so I, actually I empower some of part of my society so that's until going now so i'm hoping to be able to make more batik in the future maybe we can do something about the batik and because we can we can uh, make some action too because kpsi now we lost our office of uh, office like a secretary secretary office we usually come there people are usually come here to to ask about anything in jakarta you have to close the office because we don't have any funds so i'm I'm planning to someday if we could do some exhibition to make a, an auction, maybe we can donate all of the the batik or our artwork that we can do. So thank you. Thank you for the question, Dr. Tere. Thank you for joining. Okay. Thank you. That's all my response. Thank you. Thank you, Masanto. Also, I, I would like to invite a number of our audience now. We've got we've got three questions. Um uh Dimas Mohammed. I think you're here and would you unmute your microphone and ask your question to the panelists, please? Yes, thank you, Aliza. Okay, my name is Dimas. I'm a GP. I am the one who asked about the LGBT community. Uh, but yeah, that's for another time, I think. But my question uh, is especially a uh, question to Dr. Diana, Dr. Nova, and Dr. Adi, who practice uh, mental health services every day. As we all know that the Ministry of Health is very uh, very uh, committed into technological uh, em uh, empowerment in, in health services in general but how does this help the psychiatrist the psychologist to provide mental health services because they are the, the fields that cannot lose the human touch the human connection uh, a few psychiatrists told me that they, are, they do not prefer telemedicine for their uh, services. So what is the potential of technology in psychiatry or a mental, other mental health services uh, based on your professions? Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Dimas. Um, can I also invite uh, Professor Johanna to unmute her microphone and to ask her question? Please, Digai. Please, Lisa. <laughs> Uh, usually, I just call Diana. Uh, Diana, <laughs> uh, you are you are having the Center for Public Mental Health. I wonder uh, you are collaborating with the community using Kader Sehat so that uh, uh, working together with the, the psychologists at Puskesmas. That they can use post shandu not only for the children but uh, and also the older people but also uh, you can uh, give some uh, psychoeducation to prevent uh, the, the the what you call it the, the community uh, mental health issues uh, i'm I'm not so sure whether you have done that before. Thank you. And I think we have one further question. Um, we've now got Dr. Rati. I think you're here. And would you like to ask your question to the panelists as well, please? Okay, thank you for the time, Aliza. Uh, I, my name is Dr. Rati. I'm from Jakarta. Uh, my question for the panelists, especially to Dr. Nova, is uh, suicide is a very sensitive issue for us Indonesian, but we all know it's a big, a big problem, but not always seen. Um, I am a GP working for the community team mental health. Uh, so what do you think I can do to help uh, the public 
to educate the public ab about suicide and what kind of approach do I need to do? Thank you so much for your time and thank you for answering my question. I might throw this over to um, Matt Nova to start off with, to talk a little bit more about the suicide issues. And also we did, I haven't forgotten you, um, Emmy, you were asking a little bit more about the suicide prevention guidelines. Emmy, by the way, is joining us from very, very early in the morning at the moment in Italy. So we want to thank Emmy for, for getting up very early in the morning for the rest of it. It's, it's a reasonable hour, but for her, it's a little bit early. So I want to just throw it over to, to Nova, if you can talk a little bit more about the suicide, um, the issues around suicide and particularly the suicide prevention guidelines um, to respond specifically to, um, to, um, to, to one of our questions here around suicide, please, if you could talk about that. Uh, okay, Lisa. And also um, afterwards, I will address a little from Dimas uh, regarding telemedicine. So thank you to uh, Dr. Rati, but I did a very long presentation about this, uh, particularly for GPs just last Sunday. Uh, it's it's uh, with Al on Alomedica, I presented about suicide prevention, um, but I want to focus more here on uh, what Arminia uh, uh, ask um, in the chat box. I hope somewhat it, it, it can relate to one another. Um, so, so this is the thing. I also, um, I, I was asked by uh, the Ministry of Health and WHO uh, to develop an uh, instrument, uh, which was an early detection of risk factors for suicide, suicidal ideation among teenagers as vulnerable group. So I, I even I, had to ensure that this work is also being utilized uh, in the guide in the draft uh, of guidelines for suicide prevention and treatment because the personal the personnel in the directorate of mental health have been rolled to different directorates so sometimes there is an information gap and so i um i i feel like I can also convey um, the information about the work that um, you have done uh, regarding the, the, the suicide first aid guidelines for Indonesia. Uh, I think they have not really uh, completed uh, the draft. Uh, so far, it consists of um, identifying risk factors and protective factors, uh, what kind of mental health promotion that can be done, what kind of suicide prevention that can be done, and early detection of suicide, and also handling of risk factors and suicide action. And they're trying to develop also programs, surveillance, and information systems. So probably the National Suicide Registry System. So I think um, your, your work uh, on uh, suicide first aid guidelines, it can somewhat be introduced to uh, the Ministry of Health. I will check because the director has just been changed. So I'm, I hope he's still uh, doing the same work with the previous uh, director. I will check on that one, Arminia. Thank you so much uh, for this initiative. Uh, as in, for Dr. Uh, Rati, uh, you should uh, first educate yourself more about suicide prevention from terminology um, to uh, identifying risk factors and to and how to uh, utilize uh, early detection uh, instrument you have to be fully equipped and you have you you need to understand what uh, people with suicidal ideation need that way you can educate uh, because um, even doctors can give uh, a very wrong response in emergency room, for 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 instance, uh, they can lecture, uh, they can give sermon <laughs> to someone who just commit, uh, who just tried to, uh, suicidal uh, uh, attempt. So uh, I think uh, that's it, and you should follow more um, of well webinar or whatever workshop on suicide prevention. Just last Sunday we did it with Alomedica, and please. Uh, try to maybe follow Alomedica because they, they do this uh, uh, on serial uh, webinar, particularly on suicide as well. Uh, on telemedicine also, Aliza? Um, I continue with the suicide guidelines for a moment. Okay. I, might okay. just throw it, I might throw it over to Deanna, who has obviously been working on these, on these as well. And yeah. you might want to talk a little bit about, about 
that issue. And maybe also, Deanna, you might want to comment at the same time um, on uh, Professor Johanna's uh, a fantastic idea about looking at uh, Posiandu specifically around mental health issues and wondering whether that's something that has been, been considered um, at, at, at any level of the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rate, for your uh, amazing question. Yeah. Uh, if only all the GP thing like uh, the way you think, yeah, it is very good because uh, most of the suicidal person have ever been in health system before. And um, with Dr. Elminia Kolucci, we actually already uh, made a guideline. Yeah, uh, on uh, uh, Elminia post in the chat. That's the English version. Uh, the Indonesian version is will be in that uh, link as well. And uh, so what we can do is we need to train people, yeah, uh to do the uh, suicide prevention and that uh, guideline provides step by step guideline uh we 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 do hope that we can roll the training after this with dr Arminia ecology soon and uh, regarding the telemedicine is it oh no not yet about uh, <laughs> prof johanna yeah <laughs> prof johanna is actually the pioneer of the psycholog puskesmas yeah she is uh, initiating yeah. that long uh, maybe in 1980 uh, something yeah prof uh, when uh, faculty of psychology working with uh, puskesmas in yogyakarta and uh, what the center for public mental health currently do uh, in regard with uh, psycholog puskesmas is we have become their partner the dinkes partner to advancing their knowledge, their skill in specific area, uh, including uh, about uh, mental health literacy, psychoeducation, uh, how to utilize cadder, how to uh, do the brief uh, uh, CBT, for example, and then uh, about also uh, lifespan development program, developing lifespan development program in Puskesmas, like and we also uh, help them produce the SOP. Uh, SOP is uh, what, to, uh, what to call SOP. SOP is like standard standard procedure. Like uh, it's like something like in Sleman. Uh, or for for example, uh, the first uh, visit of a pregnant woman, they need to see psychologists. For the, those who will get married like someone here want to get married soon <laughs> they need to go to they need to go uh, to the uh, uh, psychologist so that's what uh, actually uh, uh, they do in the puskesmas but the innovation between puskesmas are uh, different each other like uh, it's very depend on how puskesmas arranging their budget so some uh, some of uh, them yeah having innovation with uh, posyandus but some of them with pkk for family strengthening some of them have uh, innovation with uh, uh, for example uh, mental health day in the puskesmas something like that uh, prof so but this i think a very good idea how to make uh, posyandu uh, reach out to the community because most of the people engaging with uh psycholog puskesmas are mostly women through pkk yeah so that's uh, uh the good very good idea and i will throw this to the puskesmas in psychology in psychologies in puskesmas yeah aliza thanks thanks diana um i'm wondering also if we could we can shuffle it across to mas anto who might want to talk a little bit about the impact of telemedicine um, initiatives on the consumer group movement and maybe um maybe hans has also got some comments around that about telemedicines as far as i knew and the in the community we are not really into the telemedicine actually not much of us really using the method the, the 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 technology actually in the community we prefer to just chat with the with the groups then if we someone need to be assist then 
uh, the psychiatrist or psychologist in in the in the group will will approach the uh, ours our member who needs support. So I think that's what I can uh, uh, respond. Uh, it, but then it's still a positive way to to engage with this service. Although the telemedicine is with with a lot of obstacles and everything, because not not all of people are comfortable with the with the methods. Thank you. I think Emmy was just saying how she how much she missed the call to prayer. I had to read that out because I think for us, um, I'm in Australia, so is so is Hans, and I think some of the others um, who are joining us today from the Indonesian Institute, um, Ed and and Ali. I think we we are very involved in travelling to and from Indonesia in terms of research, and obviously this is something that hasn't happened for a long period of time. So it's always nice to get those contextual cues. Um, Maybe Hans, do you want to comment a little bit more about telling uh, medicine before we throw it back to um, Nova to talk a little bit more about that? And probably Deanna as well. I think she had something to add. Something medicine in general, telemedicine. Wondering about telemedicine and the, the saying that Masanto was talking about the, the consumer groups not really interacting with telemedicine in a huge way. And I'm wondering if you've got <laughs> about how how that might be utilised to sort of. To, and and may grow for the consumer group movement. Yeah, well, let me address a few things that have come up in the discussion. The consumer groups are mostly volunteer, and they receive a little bit of money here and there. This is a problem because they're very idealistic, very motivated. But you know, you got to pay your rent as well. I think in all countries, but specifically in Indonesia, I think there should be a third sector beyond government an industry or commercial world, the voluntary sector, NGOs moving that sphere. I think there should be funding for these voluntary movements like KPSE uh, to do their activities because they do them really, really well. Um, there, there are some initiatives now to bring uh, telehealth uh, closer to uh, these uh, consumer movements. We should be very careful that telehealth, specifically mental health apps, could be an easy cop out from providing the real care. Now, my university promotes all kinds of apps that you know, help you meditate, help you fall asleep. This is all terrific, but this is not mental health interventions. They can be good for the mental health of people who are mentally healthy, but you know, if you have a psychotic break, then listening to meditation tapes is just not going to do anything. So it's really important if there are apps available that could really help with the tyranny of distance in Indonesia, because especially in the East, with all its islands, people need to travel sometimes days before to see a doctor and especially a psychiatrist. But these apps should not operate on their own. There should be a human support staff that can jump in if the app in itself is not sufficient to organize referrals for consultations. These consultations could also be done by smartphone or Zoom or whatever. And there is really something to explore further that could make a real difference. This also means, of course, that infrastructure in the East needs to be improved, internet availability, etc. But there are lots of opportunities there. And I think it is a golden idea to, to think, to, to, to involve the consumer groups KPSE into the light by Polycare Indonesia to develop apps that they think will be useful for their members. So to bring that expertise on building these apps together with the people who know from experience what it is like to have these conditions. We might go briefly back to um, Nova. Do you want to talk a little bit about the telemedicine? You were very keen. There has been an increase of awareness among Indonesians uh, about mental health ever since the pandemic. This increase seems to appear together with the growth of digital mental health. Um, psychological first aids through online services have been highly in demand. So uh, apps such as Sehat Jiwa provided by the Ministry of Health was relaunched last year on World Mental Health Day 2020. But there is always a limited number of services being provided. The consultation is free to the users, but somebody's got to pay for their professional services. Um, and remote consultations, such as telepsychiatry, it, uh, it provides services according to regulations. And these 
are relatively new regulations being um, distributed to the psychiatrists during the pandemic. The reluctance, uh, I think, somewhat is related to the limited services we can provide to the patients in regard to the strict rules and regulations. And also uh, the fear of prescribing certain medications such as anti-anxiety medicines, such as benzo benzodiazepine, which can be against the law um, in Indonesia. So I think that's the, uh, that's the pro pros and cons of um, uh, utilizing the telepsychiatry or telemedicine. I think we've also got another question from an audience member um, here. Uh, I think, but Fordi, if I'm not mistaken, would you like, the mic is all yours, if you're here. Thank you, Aliza. Uh, so I actually previously am active in Into the Light Indonesia before I left the organization last year, after receiving scholarship. <laughs> So I think my question uh, to Dr. Ade is about uh, the issue of the geographic pickup in Indonesia. And you previously mentioned that uh, the budgeting is really small and it has been also shown in uh, Dr. Nofa's uh, slides about the budgeting issue in Indonesia. Um, what do you think we can do with this kind of limitation? And actually, the second one is just I wanted to, uh, to share my experience. So I think just a few years ago, a neighbor of mine recently died by suicide. And then one of our neighbors uh, was, I think, a researcher affiliated with University of Indonesia's pharmacy department. So he, I mean, he has the... Uh, I think some sort of name recognition because his office affiliation. And then uh, I think he dealt with the policeman of the, uh, the police department of Indonesia. And he managed to change the, change the, I think the, the, I think the death certificate of that individual, that, uh, that neighbor, and then he changed it into, he died by some sort of, uh, accident or something like that, I think it's very, it, it makes it very difficult for the National Registry uh, suicide, uh, based on my experience at Indonesia, Indonesia, it makes it very difficult for us to track the number, the specific number of death uh, by suicide in Indonesia. I think uh, maybe you can uh, comment on that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... Aliza and Pa Verdi uh, for the question about the uh, geographical challenges and the budgeting. I have to put a disclaimer that I'm no longer a practicing medical doctor. I mostly, uh, my vantage point is a former uh, doctor in a puskesmas and a uh, medical anthropologist looking at, uh, looking at it from a grassroots, uh, especially in the rural areas. So I, uh, I, am a witness also of, of the difficulty to reach, um, you know, po populations that are hard to reach and are in need of mental health care, be it in severe mental uh, illness condition or uh, even less. I think with regards to budgeting, we have to uh, acknowledge that first we have a over-reliance of uh, a, a particular type of service where, uh, there, there is a program from the health offices, local health offices, for uh, health workers either in the local health offices, uh, mental health program, and uh, co in collaboration with uh, um, health workers at the Puskesmas to go and do these outreach, um, uh, uh, what is it, programs, which are not always happening in a on a regular basis to all places. So the, this over-reliance of this model of care is what we need to uh, untangle and, and deconstruct and see uh, whether we can introduce a, you know, a more, more progressive and perhaps out-of-the-box kind of, uh, of uh, skill mix care at the primary and community health level. And this is also where we look at, uh, where Together for Mental Health uh, tries to look at, trying to look at actual allies, resources that are already in place uh, that uh, the community are seeking help uh, to for mental health care, but uh, are under-recognized in the system. Uh, but what we need to create is an alliance with them. 
Um, and so that, that is first. First of all, it's bringing down and looking at what resources we already have in the communities and trying to then combine that with, um, with the uh, potential of telemedicine. Uh, because we look at in Flores, for instance, uh, there are only two uh, psychiatrists. One is full time and one is part time flying back and forth from Kupang to Ende. Uh, and uh, rather than having them can only serve, you know, places that they can geographically reach. We can provide a system where this skill mix at the primary level can have a con consultation uh, system, for instance. And that is for the, for the medical uh, side of uh, treatment. Uh, and then, uh, as, as uh, Hans also pointed out, we cannot just look at this as a capture of like, oh, technology will solve this. But also we have to, uh, to, to um, expand our, our view of not this being a treatment gap, but also a care gap. So we have to look into like uh, resources or, or uh, budgets from other sectors, not only in medical health care. Um, and then uh, we also have to uh, uh, understand that uh, Dr. Nova previously mentioned about the fear to prescribe medications because, because it is not, not uh, if the medications are not there, not well distributed, then the physicians and the, and the uh, nurses, they are not uh, confident I can't even talk about the competency because we're not measuring it properly. So they're not even confident about using the medication. So we have to also provide uh, training and, and mentoring uh, programs for, for uh, health workers at the community level uh, so that they can improve their, their confidence in, in providing these mental health care. And then lastly, with regards to budgeting, we also have to understand that uh, the structural uh, support needs to be there. Indicators for minimum uh, service uh, has to include uh, things that are beyond just severe mental illness, which is what it is existing now. I might be wrong. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Uh, Nova and, and Ibu Diana and uh, Mas Anto and Hans can, can talk more. Perhaps these are changing, but the current uh, si uh, system is only recognizing uh, severe mental illness uh, as the indicators for minimum care. So I think, I think those, those things need to be addressed when we talk about budgeting. Thank you. I think we've got a number of other questions flooding in also, and we're basically to time. We might, more on my half, but um, take, basically extend the webinar at just a few minutes, maybe five minutes more. Um, I can see that individuals are sort of talking about, that consistently we're getting things coming up around the lack of resources and particularly the urban rural divide. And we've talked a little bit about the telemedicine and some, uh, some resources that are being used to try and access those populations. Um, I know that um, together for mental health, the, um, the, the, the attempt is to marry the traditional with the modern hasn't really spoken much about in terms of that, that particular project. And I'm wondering, Emmy, if I give you, three minutes could you give us a little bit more information about that project and and um when the screening is going to happen for instance thank you lisa and uh, of course asti being uh, the uh, research co director of the project and uh, diana the uh, uh, indonesia investigator please chip in at any point uh, i just give a link because i think uh, is a is a good to know there is a place where people interested can go and uh, read more about the project but also find um, a lot of uh, links which are obviously going to be progressing as we are releasing uh, more materials. But as the, the um, uh, excerpt showed, uh, it was only 12 minutes, or I think as TV and 92 minutes, the film is out now, uh, of Harmony. But how, how it shows basically what we have been doing with this research project, which was based in Indonesia and in Ghana. So it's a comparative study um, uh, using ethnographic documentary and participatory video. So it's completely visual methodology uh, based, was around looking um, at collaboration between uh, faith-based and traditional healers and mental health professionals. So what we've been doing with, uh, with Asti and uh, Diana as well has been around look, looking for in Indonesia about are there good practices? Is there something we can see about how this collaboration is possible? And when they work, what they look like? What are some of the facilitators? And actually allow collaboration. We were really looking for bidirectional collaboration, um, where, where there was a will, a willing, a will from both sides to be helping each other. Because often, uh, when uh, when people talk about collaboration, is about mental health professional going into to healers and telling them about this is the way. And obviously, these are a lot of reactions 
reaction from their side, but also assumes that there is some form of knowledge which is superior, simply because it's somehow scientifically based, when, when mental, mental health and mental illness is much more complex and there is a lot of dimension to it. So in some way, our project, it is, as Dato says, together for mental health, is to use an inclusive approach about, to, about to mental health and mental, and mental illness and, and healing. Um, but also looking about, so going back to the Pasung issue that Nova mentioned, which has been my, my first film I made in Indonesia, Breaking the Chains, and then connected to Breaking the Chains and to Story, it's also about seeing does this collaboration actually uh, eradicate or at least decrease um, human, human rights uh, abusive practices such as Pasung. Um, and so and I think it's been a very, very uh, important exploration for us uh, in, in the field. And I, I, I can say with, with confidence, we had a lot of hours of footage. Uh, we also done some uh, shorter videos. We are still editing now more films. We are hoping to do more coming out, um, but uh, capturing some of the very good examples uh, in uh, three different locations in Indonesia. Um, so um, yeah, we are now going to festivals, uh, starting actually where you are now in Canberra. So our first uh, uh, film festival release has been last week, no, 10th of October, I see right, in, uh, in Canberra. At, this is my Brave uh, festival. Now it's going to other festivals. So in the next few months, uh, the film is going to festivals, but then we'll, uh, we'll organize another um, online screening at some point, maybe beginning of next year. And then eventually the film, after it's gone to festival, will be publicly released in our website. So if you want to watch Harmony, as well as Kavom, which is the Ghana uh, film, which is about to be released as well, please do go to the website, you can follow. So then you receive some updates on uh, when things are, are released and, and when uh, please make sure to make use of this as much as we as, as you can. And I want to thank everybody here. So Asti as, as uh, the, the, the search fellow, Diana, uh, as my faithful companion <laughs> in many adventures, including this. Anse has been extremely supportive of this project and so has been Anto uh, Agus, who was part of our steering committee. And, and uh, all of these people, we are part of the same journey. It's so beautiful also with you, Elisa, to be, to be part of all of this together. So Didi, as the word says, together for mental health. Thank you so much, Emmy. Um, I really appreciate that. We're, we're actually, we're totally out of time. And I can see there's, there's a fantastic discussion that Wunin um, de Supratini has, has opened up in terms of issues around social psychological rehabilitation and the time that these sorts of things take and what sort of interventions are sort of available for those sorts of things, directing to some of the panelists, um, particularly Dr. Nova. But we're going to have to draw this seminar to a close. We are really hopeful that we continue, continue to offer um, more in-depth discussion around mental health in Indonesia to a broader audience, including um, those Indonesianists who are based in Australia. And um, we would invite you to check out the Indonesia Institute um, website, where we're going to upload the recording of these proceedings. Also, to just save the, di the date for the um, Human Rights Day in December, that the, uh, the Indonesian Institute is going to have an event around um, gender and sexuality. Um, you might want to check that out. Um, also, I just want to virtually join with you in a round of applause for all of our panelists here today. They've done a fantastic job. Um, they've produced some amazing um, introductory videos about, about mental health in Indonesia. And I hope that you've learned a little bit more about some of the questions and some of the things that you want to learn about around health systems development in Indonesia. And I hope we can continue to berjuang bersama to continue to build <laughs> build a, a stronger better um, system for Indonesia in mental health care thank you very much um, salam sejahtera and sampai ketemu lagi